All right, how's everybody doing? Welcome to this Bible study. Uh, this is The Way, The Truth, and The Life. My name is George Boyd Jr. Um, I am currently the minister at the Whelan Church of Christ here in Greenville, Texas at 1491 FM 1564 Greenville, Texas 75402. If you're in the area, come visit. If you live here, why haven't you visited? Come uh, be with us as we continue to grow in the Word of God at the Wheeling Church of Christ. And our uh, Sunday school times are 9.30. Our Sunday morning service is at 10.15. We come back at 6 p.m. on Sunday nights. And we reconvene and we continue to uh, grow together in the Lord. So today I want to start a brand new Facebook Live Bible study. I've been wanting to do this for a while just trying to help people out as it pertains to the word, uh, pertains to the word of God. Help people out not only in the church, but help people outside of the church. Because we definitely have an issue in our country. We have an issue in our churches and we have an issue in our homes. And the issue that I see is a lack of God. We need God in our lives. And not just from the perspective of face value, but we really need to gravitate towards God and learn to find all of our joy in God and not be like the world and always getting caught up in our circumstance or what I like to call happenstance because we get people they're always they're 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 almost bipolar in a sense you know everyone's bipolar whether we know it or not to a degree people are happy when things go good and then when things go bad then they're sad and their disposition changes but what we have to learn how to do is that no matter what circumstance we are in, no matter what happens in this life, that we must learn to always have joy in Christ Jesus. And so this book of Philippians is really, really going to help us with this. And I want to show us some things in Philippians. And I like to say that I'm going to show you some things in Philippians that you're not going to get in books. I mean, if you want to go and have a Bible study with commentaries and things like that. This is not the place for you. I want to give you some Bible study straight from the text and some things that I believe that can help us contextually so that we can truly understand what Paul is talking about and how we can apply these things to our own lives and have joy in our own life. And so I want to go ahead and get started here. Uh, I've been trying to start this for about a week and I'm having technical difficulties. So we're going to I think we got it rolling, so we're going to go ahead and get it going, and uh, we'll, we're going to go ahead and get knee-deep into this. We're going to do verses 1 through 11 today, and we're going to do a little background work on this book of Philippians, so we can kind of really get an understanding of what's behind this letter. Why is Paul writing this letter? What's going on at this church? Because we all know when we think about the things that people always talk about the book of Philippians, people say the book of Philippians is the book of joy. Well, I totally agree it is the book of joy, but I think we have to understand is that what Paul is talking about in this book of joy is not just mere joy, but Paul is talking about how do we have joy and maintain joy, and he also wants to talk about the things that destroy joy and the thing that destroys churches. And so as we begin to look at this book of Philippians, we believe that Paul wrote this book somewhere around 60, 61, 62 AD. And I want us to think about these things when we start looking at these books in the Bible. It is so powerful that about 32 years after Jesus has ascended, 32 years after the gospel of Jesus Christ and Paul has began to start these churches, he started the church at Philippi on his second missionary journey, where we, we see where once these churches are planted, and even after the ascension of Christ, we see where people begin to kind of fall back in a, in a sense. They kind of forget, you know, what the whole reason was of the salvation, the whole purpose of what Jesus was in the church. And you see in each one of these letters, even in the book of Philippians, people always, you know, sometimes people will say this book is a church about a church that had no issues. No, this church had some issues. Uh, just like most churches do. I mean, I don't know if there is a such thing at this point as a perfect church because we have a whole bunch of people that are not perfect in the church. You know, none of us are not 
None of us are perfect, but we're trying to be, we're, we're on our way to perfection through sanctification. But in this book of Philippians, Paul starts this around 60, 61, 62 AD. And he begins this on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16. And you can kind of go there at your leisure. But we see three major issues that happen in um, Acts chapter 16 on Paul's second missionary journey. Number one, we have the issue of where he came across Lydia and the women who were at the seaside at Philippi. And that kind of helps us to understand some things about Philippi that obviously there were not a lot of Jews there, number one. And number two, it seems that there were no synagogues, seeing that these women who obviously believe in God, but have not yet been baptized into Christ, they are at the riverside praying. And then we see another issue where, and we don't know exactly how this issue turns out, but right after Paul comes uh, among uh he comes among the uh, Lydia and her group. There's another issue going on in Philippi where we have a girl who has a spirit of divination of where she is basically fortune telling and the men at Philippi, they're using her for profit. And so Paul exercises that spirit out of her. And I would love to see what happened to the girl that he took the, the spirit of divination out of and some of those people who may have, uh, may have seen that. And then we have the third incident, which, of course, which is very famous, which is the issue about the Philippian jailer. And so when we look at Acts chapter 16 on Paul's second missionary journey, we can get a pretty good understanding of Paul obviously established this church through the work that he did there in Acts chapter 16 on his second second missionary journey, more than likely. So we come to the greeting here at, in the book of Philippians. And I want to show you something that Paul is going to begin to do right off the bat. Being a Christian is all about the transformation of the mind. We live in a world today where people make it about the transformation of the outer appearance. You know, people are always getting plastic surgery. They got fake this, fake that, wearing wigs and, and makeup and all of these different things. It's all about the transformation of the outside. But the book, of Philipp, uh, the book of Philippians is all about the inner transformation. It's all about the inner transformation and the source of our, our joy. Because one of the things that we know about people, the source of people's joy today seems to be other people. And this is why people spend so much time trying to do things that please people and try to appease what people think. But Paul is more concerned about the inner workings of the church. He's worried about the inside of the church. He's worried about the inner workings because he knows that if we can overcome these things about our, our egos and, and our own fame and glory, that we can have, we can have a centered joy on, not on outside things, but we can have a, a, a joy that's based on the inner things of which Christ Jesus, the spirit of God and God is on the inside of us through the word of God. But I want us to get right into the greeting and I want you to see something that Paul begins to do psychologically. And I say psychologically because the spirit deals with the mind. And so Paul begins to deal psychologically and spiritually. He is going to ask the church at Philippi to do some things. He wants them to do some things because he's heard some things. And when we think about this, this book of Philippians, let me make sure before I get right into this text. Let's look at the reason why Paul wrote this, this particular letter, because we like to call it the letter of joy, but there are some reasons why Paul wrote this letter. Number one, Paul wants to thank the church at Philippi for helping him on his missionary journeys. They supplied money to Paul, you know, and ministry is <laughs> ministry costs money, whether people like it or not. But, but Paul needed money to help him on his missionary journey. You know, we get all these people always talking about Paul was a tent maker. They need to understand why Paul was a tent maker and understand that Paul didn't always use the money he had. He, he got from his trade. There were churches that were faithful that Paul could depend on, like the church at Philippi, who helped Paul with money. But not only did they help Paul with money, he, he wanted to thank them for that. But he also wanted to thank them for Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was obviously a... Uh, a man, a worker in the church and the monetary gift that they 
gave Paul, well, he brought that to Paul and he actually helped Paul. And we see also in this particular setting that Paul is in prison. Not only does, uh, does, does he want to thank them for Epaphroditus, but also he wants to update them on his status. We're pretty sure that they know that Paul is in prison. So he's updating them on his status and he wants them to understand everything is good. And he also wants to update them on the status of Epaphroditus, who obviously got ill uh, during his help for Paul. But one of the things that I love is that Epaphroditus obviously alerted Paul to some issues that were going on at the church at Philippi. And I love that. And so Paul, while he takes this moment to thank them and tell them about all the joy that he has in them, he wants to address a couple of problems that Epaphroditus has told him about. Obviously, inside of the church at Philippi, this great church that Paul so dearly loves, the issue of a power struggle is developing in the church. And a lot of people don't like to look at Philippians from this perspective, but once you start digging into these texts, you can see that there are two problems in particular. There's a power struggle in the church, of egos and things of that nature. And then the other one is the Judaizers that we're going to see in Philippians 3, 2. But the Judaizers that Paul is going to deal with in Philippians chapter 3 do not seem to be as big of a problem as the things that are going on inside of the church. There is nothing that tears up churches quicker than egos people who want to be in control, people who think they have power, people who don't do things decently and in order, people who don't recognize the leadership of the church, people who begin to make the church all about doing things rather than uh, following the word of God. All of these things go into people receiving glory and people receiving honor rather than Christ receiving honor. And people sometimes they start to focus on small groups in the church or or people who've been there the longest and all of these different things. But what Paul wants the church of Philippi to understand is, is that the goal of Jesus was to bring everybody into one body, was to bring everybody in one body and that they be united through humility because the destroyer of unity is power. It is the destroyer egos. It destroys unity when people don't, quite understand their place in Christ Jesus. And then they begin to try to supersede and do all kinds of things that just don't make sense. And you may be saying, well, where do you get all this stuff that you're talking about? We're going to see this in these four beautiful chapters in, in, in the book of Philippians. We're going to see where power is one of the issues that it's the major issue that is robbing this church of joy. And so Paul, he wants them to be able to deal with things on the outside. That's great. But we also have to be able to deal with things on the inside. Persecution that comes from the inside of the church, whether it be through egos and, and people disobeying God and false doctrine and all of these things, we have to be able to deal with that. So let's kind of get into this text. I want you to see what Paul begins to do to the church at Philippi. He begins to break them down psychologically. So Paul gives his greeting. He says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you'll see something here in this greeting. You know, we wonder where are the preachers in this? Don't worry. Paul has got a special place that he's going to start talking about the preachers in this because those who preach the word of God, even though I'm pretty sure, especially in the early church, the elders were probably preaching the word of God. Make no mistake about it. The preachers have always been present in the New Testament. And I'm going to show us where God is going to use them in this book of Philippians. But first, I want you to see, some, see this thing about prayer in the book of Philippians. Now, I don't know about anyone else. But I'm a person who listens very closely to what people pray. Especially on Wednesdays and Sundays. Because you can always tell what's going on with people if you listen to their prayer. You can always tell what's going on in the church if you listen close to people's prayers. Even, you know, prayers that they ask for, you can always tell what's going on in the church. And so Paul 
is going to psychologically, as he writes this prayer to the church at Philippi, he's going to psychologically begin to immediately break them down. Because I want us to understand right off the top as we as we've mentioned briefly, but Paul is writing this letter from prison. And we don't necessarily believe it's from his Roman imprisonment. There is a belief that Paul was in prison more than once for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want you to hear what he begins to do in this prayer. Watch what he says. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So the first thing Paul wants to do is he wants the church at Philippi to understand that he's thinking about them. But let me really break this down for us, church, because this is very powerful what Paul is doing. Paul is going to tell the church at Philippi, remember, he's going to tell them in, in Philippians 2.4, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let me, let me go back another verse. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So I want you to see something that Paul is doing, which is very different than what many of us would do if we were in prison. If we were in prison, we'd be writing it how bad the food is how bad the conditions is. I didn't do anything to get in here. And I heard someone say one time on a television show that they asked, asked the person like, what did you do to get in here? Shawshank Redemption. What did you do to get in here? And the guy said nothing. And Morgan Freeman, I think it was told him that, well, everyone's innocent in prison because most people will say they didn't do what they were accused of. But I want you to see something that Paul does that really is so powerful. He's in prison. And he immediately begins to practice what he preached. But he wants to do it to them psychologically. Rather than him praying about or talking about what's going on with him and what he's suffering, he wants them to understand from the beginning, I'm in prison. For the gospel of Jesus Christ, I did not commit a crime, but in my prayers, I'm thanking God. Upon every remembrance of you, Paul is already showing them. I'm putting your interest. I'm considering your interest as I consider my own, and I'm esteeming you higher than myself. He says always in every prayer of mine making request for you all with joy. Now, Paul is setting something up. Notice what he says. Every prayer of mine, making a request for you all with joy, because we know that Paul is going to come back and say, complete my joy. So we see something that Paul is doing. Paul is building up this argument of how he has joy in them. He has joy in them. He's esteeming them higher than themselves. He's considering their interest. And he has this request, request for you in all joy because he's going to make a pivotal statement. But, but wait, he says, look, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, so I want us to catch something that Paul is doing here, church. This is something that we need to learn how to do every single Sundays in our church and every single day of our life. Paul is already beginning to ground them. He doesn't want to talk about himself. He doesn't want to talk about himself, not just yet. He wants to talk about the things that he wants for them. And he talks about for your fellowship in the gospel. So he's psychologically already breaking them down because egos or I become the problem when we start talking about unity. So he begins to talk about them as a unit for your fellowship in the gospel, because we have to understand what the gospel does. The gospel saves us, 
But some, sometimes we forget, we forget that the gospel has saved us. And we forget about that pivotal moment in our lives. And we don't find joy in our salvation. Because now that we have salvation, sometimes we get frustrated because things don't seem to be going the way we think they should once we answer the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not only does the gospel save us, but he wants them to hear something else. The gospel not only saves you, but the gospel sustains you. See, we should continue to have joy not only in our salvation, but we should continue to have joy in our sanctification because we should always remember we are saved. Why we're saved? Who saved us? The gospel saves us. The gospel sustains us. And notice he says from the first day until now, he says being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now listen, Paul is breaking them down psychologically. Paul knows they have problems. Are y'all hearing this? He knows they have problems. But Paul rather than start beating them upside the head with the problems first. Paul wants to tell them before he addresses the problem that I'm confident because I've prayed and God will hear my prayers and answer my prayers that God is going to complete the good work he started in you. Now, church, follow Paul now. He knows what he's doing. He knows that they have some issues going. But he wants them to know you can overcome your issues if you remain in Christ Jesus. Watch what he says. He says, look, just as it is right for me to think of you all. Are we catching this? This man's in prison. He says it is right for him to think of them. Now, I don't know about you. But Paul is already showing them something. See, Paul is not happy about his circumstance. I promise you he's not happy about his circumstance. But Paul ain't worried about being happy. Paul wants to show them his response to his circumstance. And he wants them to understand that their response to their circumstance ought to be the same. Because his response to his circumstances because of who he is in Christ Jesus. See, who we are in Christ Jesus ought to determine how we respond to our circumstance. Our circumstance should not determine our joy. And I love, this is why Paul continues to talk about joy in spite of his circumstance. He says, look, he said, it is right for me to think this of you all. Are we hearing this? It is right. Even though I know you've got problems, it's right for me to think of this. He said, because I have you in my heart. Are we seeing this? He's showing them something. This is deeper than compassion, church. He's trying to display the behavior that he wants them to display themselves. He's showing them what he wants them to to show each other. He's showing them what he wants them to do to answer his prayers. He says, look, in as much both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Are y'all seeing this? After all of that, now he mentions he's in chains. Now he mentions his condition but he also wants them to understand that the circumstance is not determining his outcome and his outpouring of love. Not only his outcome and his outpouring of love. Church, I want us to really dig in because Paul is saying something very deep here. Paul has not let his circumstance detract 
what he expects the outcome to be. Now, we will let our circumstance sometimes cloud the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. We'll let our circumstance knock our expectations down. I'm sorry, but let me help y'all out with something. Expectations in the wrong things is the killer of joy. But Paul's expectations are in Christ Jesus. And so since his expectations are in Christ Jesus, he believes that these things will come to fruition. And he wants them to know, church, watch what he keeps using. He says, I have you in my heart. He says, and as much as in both in my chains and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, the good news, he said, you are all partakers with me of grace. Now, the thing that we need to gravitate towards when we study the book of Philippians, and he uses this word, you. Now, the English language has this problem a lot. Sometimes you, you have to read context to understand singul singular and plural. But when you look at these words in the Greek, he's talking about plural. Because church, he wants the entire church to understand you're all in this together. This is not about an individual. This is about all of us together. And this is why he says you are all partakers with me of grace. And I love this. He says, for God is my witness. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I think this is the uh, affection that Jonathan had for David. That when we're in Christ Jesus, church, we ought to be kindred spirits. Now, I want to break something down for us, church. Because when we have the affection of Christ, we not only want to see the people that we quote unquote love or the people in our group. We want to see the whole church. We should look forward on Sundays to seeing the whole church. On Wednesdays to sing the whole church. We ought to look forward to seeing the church even in our everyday life outside of the building. The affection of Christ is not a respecter of person. And so Paul, he's breaking this down. And I love, he says God is his witness. Because God has been hearing his prayers. God knows his heart. And he wants them to understand that he is longing for them. He loves them. He has affection for them and he wants to not only see them. Paul's going deeper than he wants to see them. Paul wants to see them succeed. This is one of the things that just bothers me in the church. Everyone wants their own success, but they don't want other people to succeed. We will spend time bragging on people and bragging on people that we bragging on ourselves and bragging on certain groups when at the end of the day it's not what individuals do it's what the whole church does and we know who does what amongst us but at the end of the day the goal is for it's one goal salvation of the one body and to continue to bring people into that body to love people. The gospel should save us. The gospel should sustain us. So, Paul says here in these last three verses, and this is where we're going to end today. But I want you to see something that Paul does here very cleverly, as he says in this, I pray. Paul is about to give and outline through his prayer for the entire book of Philippians. And when I first read this a couple of weeks ago, because I've read the book of Philippians, I've studied it for years. It's one of my favorite books to preach out of. But I had never looked at this like this before. Go back and look at this on your own and study this. This is why I say, Listen to what people pray. True prayers 
true prayer warriors will always tell you what's going on, what they want to happen. They'll tell you things that they are concerned about, what's important to them. They'll tell you what they, they will tell you their life if you listen to people's prayers. And if you listen to people's prayers, you'll learn how to proceed and help them in their life. Watch what Paul says. Paul says, this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. Now, I I'm going to stop there. Because, see, we live in a world today where people say love is love. People say um, love is God, which is not true. Love cannot stand on its own. Love, love is not something that can stand on its own. Love is defined by the source, which is God. God is love, but love is not God. He says, I want your, he says, your love may abound still more and more. We have a world today to just say love people, just love people unconditionally and all this stuff. And, and I get it. I get it. But Paul wants to be very specific. He says that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Whoa, whoa. Listen to what he just told him. He just gave an outline. He wants their love to abound more and more as in as we learn better, we do better. My mother-in-law, I've told this story many times to people, but my mother-in-law got mad at me one time because I told her when I first married my wife, I really didn't love her. And that just stinged her because, you know, she was like, no, you, you, you had to love her to marry her. You know, yeah, to a degree. But I'll put it like this. I didn't truly understand what love was until I found Jesus Christ. It wasn't until I found Jesus Christ that I truly learned how to love my wife. And so as I learned more and more about the scriptures, as I learned more and more about the love of God, the love of Christ and the love of the Holy Spirit and what God expected of me in a marriage, my love has abounded more and more as we have went on because now my love is not centered in myself. Y'all following this? My love is not centered on me. My love for my wife is not centered on me being pleased. My love for my wife is centered around pleasing God. My love for my wife is centered around doing things that please God and please her and not just myself. So Paul in this prayer right here, these three verses, he's going to give an outline that he's going to go on to explain for the rest of this book. He says, I want you, for the rest of this letter, he says, in knowledge and all discernment. See, discernment is important. Discernment is important, isn't it, church? Isn't it, people? Isn't it important? Especially when Paul's going to get to Philippians chapter 3, and he's going to talk about the Judaizers. We have to learn how to love God through discernment and knowledge. We have to learn how to love people through discernment and knowledge. So that we don't subject ourselves to people who do who who are toxic, people who want to take us down, people who want to do things that are against God. We don't have to subject ourselves to that. We have to learn how to love in the appropriate manner. He says, Look, that you may approve the things that are excellent. Because Paul is going to come right back in Philippians 3. And he's going to deal with this. He's going to deal with this in Philippians 3. And even this whole deal about let your love abound still more and more. He's going to deal with that in Philippians chapter 2. But he says, look, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Amen. Amen. Because he's going to mention that in Philippians 2, isn't he? He's going to talk about the fact that we are light bearers. And how we are sincere and how we are to be sincere. Look at this. Being filled 
with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Watch what he does. Paul is going to systematically, these three verses in particular, Paul is about to systematically, and you're going to see, I'm going to deal with this book. It'll probably take me, I'm going to do more than Wednesdays. I think I'm going to come back tomorrow and Friday and deal with more verses. I want to get through, it's going to take me a month to get through this book with us, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to go back. Every time Paul references one of these verses in the prayer, I'm going to show you where he does it in the book of Philippians. So we're going to pick up here. Uh, we're going to pick up here the next time in this Bible study on the book of Philippians and about power. I'm going to show you why I have labeled this whole thing power. So once again, if you're ever in the area of Greenville, Texas, please come out and join us at the Wheeland Church of Christ here in Greenville, Texas. That is 1491 FM 1564, Greenville, Texas 75402. We meet together. We're meeting together tonight at 7 p.m. If you're in the area, we meet on Sunday mornings at uh, 9.30 for Sunday school and we meet 10.15 for, for the worship service and 6 p.m. for our evening service. And I'm telling you, uh, we go deep into the word of God. So come visit us if you're in the area. And tomorrow I'm going to announce the time, but we're going to get right back into this Bible study of the book of Philippians. And we're going to truly understand how do we have unity in Christ Jesus. So may God bless you. May God keep you. May the gospel save you. And may the gospel sustain you. To God be the glory.